So welcome. Um, for those of you that have attended our stuff before, we're GEM, Global Initiative for Expert Manual Therapists. And for those of you that are joining the first time, you know, welcome. We're really glad that you guys have jumped on. So Dr. Singh and myself are both two U.S.-based physiotherapists. Dr. Singh did his bachelor's there in New Delhi and has since been in the United States. What is it going on? 15, 16, 17 years? Almost and, 16. Um, hey, guys, just mute yourselves. Just mute yourselves if you don't mind. Just so we can have a clean recording and everyone can listen in. So <clears throat> I actually grew up in Zimbabwe. Dr. Singh grew up in um, India. And we've both been in the States for almost the same time, 15, 16, 17 years. And um, there's uh, very few physiotherapists in the USA, and I dare say in the world, that have our level of formal training. So we're both specialists in orthopedics. Dr. Singh is also a specialist in sports. And we've both completed fellowship programs. Dr. Singh has participated in two fellowship programs in the United States for orthopedic and manual therapy. So, um, yeah, welcome aboard. Um, we're going to be talking today about ACL stuff. Before we jump into that, let me throw a quick plug for our educational platform. So Dr. Singh and I um, teach online, and GEM is our venue for that, Global, Ex Global Initiative for Expert Manual Therapists. And while we do lectures on various topics, and some of them are free and promotional lectures like this one, next weekend we're going to be doing one for a PT school there in India, but it's open for anybody to join, and we're going to be demonstrating what I think are about 10 or so of the most important manipulations that every single physical therapist should master and be able to perform. So we're going to be doing that next weekend. And in addition to that, guys, we've got a cohort running. So we have a one-year certification program in orthopedic and manual therapy. And basically what it is, it's the latest and the greatest um, for every single body part. So from we do cervical, we do thoracic spine and ribs, shoulder, elbow, hand, hip, knee, ankle, foot, back, and SI joint as well. And so within one year, we are trying to impart our knowledge and skill set onto anyone who joins into the cohort. We've got about 20 that attended our first lecture. Um, if you miss that, we have rolling admissions through about the end of April. So it's not too late to join on and, um, and we can catch you up on that first lecture because it was recorded. And um, yeah, in addition to having this one year certification program, we're also hoping that we can take a few out of the cohort um, and have them become mentors for us, which means that you guys might start teaching under the umbrella of GEM. You might also, if you're an experienced clinician or if you just demonstrate high aptitude with hands-on skills with manual therapy, we're going to handpick a few out of the cohort that are going to become mentors for us. And by being a mentor, that means that in future cohorts, we'll have students that will want to pair up with mentors if, in different regions the students will pay a tuition for that. And so being a mentor, you'll get paid for your teaching time. You would get paid for housing a student for a few weeks and imparting your knowledge onto them. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create this domino effect that's going to lead to, you know, in three years, four years, five years, the quality of physical therapy being way higher than it is. The quality the, the hands-on skills, because when I came out of, even when I came out of doctorate here in the United States, my manual therapy was subpar. It was really tragic, actually. And the kind of therapists that we're trying to create all over the world, I think are going to be masters in, 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 in a couple of different things. We want them to be masters in specific exercise, right? Selecting the correct stretches and exercises that are evidence-based and effective for our patients. That's a given. Most physios are pretty good at that already. That's kind of what we do. To grow beyond that and become expert manual therapists, and then to grow beyond that and be able to have the skills to perform dry needling and other evidence-based interventions. And so now, instead of having patients that need to go to chiropractic, that go to physiotherapy, and that go to acupuncture, that go to hijama cupping, that have to go to four or five different places to get the fix, we want physiotherapists to be the one-stop shop. Patients don't need to go anywhere else. We should be able to do everything that a patient needs to get them better from a, from a pre-operative, post-operative, or non-operative conservative uh, intervention. 
So anyways, Jim is excellent. Dr. Singh and I have been teaching through another platform for about three years, and this is the 2.0 version of that. This is the 2.0 version of that. It's going to be infinitely better. We want you guys to join on. And um, yeah, Dr. Singh, would you like to kick it off? Sure. So this is a picture from the uh, latest game that happened. I think we all are cricket fans. So my friend landed here on his knee, had a great two ACL tear, uh, was not able to control flexion, had a little valgus effect and had a great two ACL tear. So ACL injuries are very, very common. We see them all the time. Okay. We're going to talk about some of the diagnostic tests and we, we're going to talk about a little bit about the research behind it. So the test of choice is Lachman's. You can look at the sensitivity and specificity is really high. Anterior drawer and pivot shift are not great. Pivot shift is good, good specificity. People who attended the first lecture, they should know what sensitivity and specificity is. We are always looking for highly sensitive and highly specific tests. If you're trying to rule, you're trying to rule in or rule out the diagnosis. Okay. When pivot shift test is performed and under anesthesia, the sensitivity and specificity is great. Another important do you want me to demonstrate those? Yes, just give me one second. Okay. So when we talk about ACL, we divide ACL into two parts. Your anterior medial band, and then you have a posterior lateral band. When your knee is in complete extension, your these bands are parallel. You can see they are parallel. Yeah. When you flex the knee, they crisscross. Okay. They crisscross each other. Usually, and it can there can be exceptions, but usually with ext extension or hyperextension, usually you have posterior lateral band being injured or compromised. When you flex the knee and twist or rotate, especially beyond 100 degrees, 110 degrees of flexion, your AMB gets injured. Okay. The critical thing is Lachman is really good for PLB and interior drawer is great for AMB. Okay. But still Lachman is the test of choice if you're comparing all these tests. Okay. Obviously, MRI is a gold standard. We always look for some imaging when you're suspecting ACL injury. Uh, Dr. Ford, can you demonstrate these now? Are you there? Yeah. Now you can demonstrate these. And... All right. Sophie, you ready? This is one of my texts, Sophie. Everybody say hi, Sophie. All right, just come lay on your back for me, so and kick off your shoes if you like. Scooch them up a little bit. All right. Okay, so your job's just to relax, okay? okay? All right, so let's go in order on the slide. So the Lockman is number one, okay? So we're going to bring the knee up into the loose packed position. Do you guys know what the loose packed position is? And for our cohort guys, remember our first lecture when we talked about closed packed and loose packed, and we said you guys need to review that information and memorize it. So in the knee, it's about 30 degrees. Okay. This is one reason Lockman is superior to the anterior drawer because at anterior drawer, we do it at about 80 degrees, but Lockman, we do it at 30. So for Lachman, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the inside of the tibia. That's going to allow me to provide an anterior translation, but also an external rotation, a little bit of an external rotation moment. So, uh, and then grab the distal femur like so. Okay. And we're going to look for the excursion. So stabilize femur, pull anteriorly on the tibia. And we're looking for an excursion greater than more than three millimeters difference than the other side. I like to do kind of a big, slow excursion. And I also like to do kind of quick flicks. Yeah. TJ, will you? I don't think we can see the slide right now. 
Uh, I think I stopped sharing because I think it doesn't, when we record it, it doesn't. Sh it, okay, so that's fine. So no, 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 we're good. So let's go ahead and do anterior drawer, anterior drawer. Here's how I like to do it. I'm going to just stabilize the foot here by sitting on it. So Sophie, I'm going to just sit on your foot just to hold your leg. And then I'm going to wrap both my hands around the tibia as close to the joint line as you can. Don't grab it down here. As close to the joint line as you can. The knee's just shy of 90. And we're going to check for the excursion here. Okay. One thing about uh, Lockman and anterior drawer tests is that we need to rule out PCL injury beforehand. Because if there's a PCL injury, you'll get a false positive because there'll be so much excursion and translation. We're not showing it today, but to rule out a PCL test, there's the posterior drawer. And then there's also the SAG sign. Okay. Posterior drawer test and SAG sign. So make sure you rule those out before checking for ACL. There'll be too much excursion. There'll be too much laxity already. The pivot shift. Okay. Follow the instructions. So we're going to take the hip up into 30 degrees. We're going to bring it out into 30 degrees as well. You're going to grab the calcaneus. Okay. With the calcaneus, you're going to provide an internal rotation moment to the leg. Then we're going to contact below the knee, kind of the tibia and the fibula. And what we're going to do is provide a valgus force. When the knee is in extension, if there's an ACL interruption, a partial tear or a complete tear, when I provide a valgus force at the knee, it's actually going to cause the translation. So at this moment, we're causing anterior translation if there's a partial tear or a complete tear, okay? And then when, when we perform the test, when there's a clunk or a shift, it's the knee reducing because of tension on the IT band. So if there's laxity, we've already activated it now. Okay, internal rotation at the, at the calcaneus, valgus force at the fibula, and then we're gonna just bend the knee. You would expect a clunk if there was laxity or, or a complete tear. Clunk, the clunk, which is the, the tibia jogging back would usually happen at 30 to 40 degrees, 30 to 40 degrees of knee bend. So those were our three tests. There's actually one more. This is bonus content. The Lely test or the lever sign. And let me just tell you guys about the research on this one. So the research is, is minimal. I think there's been two studies done on it. The first study was done by the creator of this test, and he was very generous to himself, um, and he gave the test 100% sensitivity and specificity, and they tested about 400, they tested about 400 people, and this is, they tested acute and chronic, they tested partial tears and complete tears, and they said that 100%, they can rule in and rule out. ACL tear. There was another study that was done on this initial study that was uh, that gave 94% sensitivity and 98% specificity, which is pretty good. But I think we may need some more testing to be done. Hopefully, some additional tests will be done and we can see. Um, but here is the Lely test, L E L L I, also, and this is also called the Lever sign. Okay, so I'll demonstrate on this one. So I'm going to take a fist or a foam roll and place it under the distal cap. I'm going to use a fist for my purposes. So I'm going to take a fist, place it under the, sorry, the proximal calf, the proximal one-third. And then on the distal one-third of the femur, I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to provide posterior, posterior translate, translation force to the femur. 
And I want you guys to notice what's happening to the heel. The heel's coming up, okay? The heel's coming up. So that means that my ACL is intact. If there is a lax ACL or a torn ACL in an acute patient, a chronic patient, a partial tear or a complete tear, the heel will not rise up and there will be some translation. If you look at the other studies, the other studies say that greater than three millimeters of laxity or translation would, would be positive and, and indicate an ACL injury. So I would probably extrapolate that same degree of, of laxity into this test. Um, but yeah, so that's the Lely test. Bonus content for the day. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. You can hop up. Yeah. Going back so, to the presentation. Thank we'll you, Dr. Fukuda, for sharing. So, people who work in sports setting, they might know about this equipment, KD arthrometer. You can measure that three millimeter through this equipment. If it's greater than three millimeter of excursion, which Dr. Ford was talking about, you, you, you basically it's positive for a complete rupture. Okay, sensitivity and specificity both are great, but most of us don't have this equipment in the clinic. So, okay, so let's talk about this clinical situation. And I need your answers and feedback from this. And this is actually a real patient I saw many, many years ago, and I was not aware about how should we approach this. And I did not have a clue, to be honest. So, so this patient is a 26 year old female. She was one of my coworkers and came to me with mild knee pain. She worked in the same clinic, so it was easy to see her. Patient had no mechanism of injury, but reported that she had a history, 10 year history of knee, severe knee injury during a soccer game. She was 26, so this happened when she was 16. She had MRI done recently and she had no ACL. But no rehab was done at that point of time and, and she had a complete ACL tear at that point of time. So I saw her now, 10 years later, and I'm confused whether I should treat this patient. She has mild symptoms or should I send it back to the surgeon or should I do both? Treat her and send it back to the surgeon. Anybody who can jump in and tell me what we should do and how should we approach this patient? And I think one of you texted me on WhatsApp and asked me the same question about one of their friends. They have, they have rehabilitation later, okay. Had a similar situation where they have ACL deficient knee. They don't have a lot of symptoms we have, yeah, we have. Okay. I think uh, Dr. Ford, you're mute. I'm sorry, you're mute. Oh, sorry. Thank yeah. you, sorry. No, I just said there was an answer in there that I liked, which is basically says we need more information. You know, the answer calls for more information. Because it's like you could, you know, you could rehab this patient or you could refer them to the physician. What's right and what's wrong? We're going to, Dr. Singh has put together the latest research that spells out what do we need to look at? What do we need to do? Yeah. Okay. So the answer to this question is we have to, the patient has to go undergo a series of tests before making a decision whether this patient needs a surgery or not. Okay, so this patient has to go like, according to the research, this patient has to go through eight tests, four subjective, four objective. And then, so the first screening guideline is whether this patient has joint effusion. Okay, we can always measure joint effusion. Can this patient make a hop without, without pain? The patient has full knee range of motion and has greater than 70% of strength on the involved side when you compare it to the uninvolved side. If this patient passes this criteria, passes, if the patient fails this criteria, the test, the screening guideline is over. Okay. And this is, this is pure research. This comes out from pure research. This, this has been studied over and over. So that's why this has made to the CPG guideline, clinical prediction guideline by APTA. So you, you check for these four things. 
If your patient passes these four things, then you do next four subject objective tests. The next four objective test is a noise hop test, which I will discuss in greater detail. There's a normative criteria for noise hop test and we'll share the research article. It's by Myers 2014. They talk about this hop test in detail and how you should, how you should score this test. And there's a normative criteria for that. If patient scores greater than 80%, then the patient passes the noise hop test from involved to uninvolved side. And then there's a knee outcome survey, which you can find on Google. Patient should score more than 80%. And then there's global rating of knee scale, which is greater than 60%. And the patient should not have any episodes of giving way. The patient shouldn't tell you that when I walk, I feel like I'm stumbling. If out of these eight criteria, four subjective and four objective, patient passes all these eight criteria, then the patient is a rehabilitation candidate. If patient fails even one of the criteria, then a patient is a candidate for surgery. Okay. So I know this is hard. It is hard to administer all the eight tests, but this is the, this is the right way to go about it. I did not do it when I saw that patient several years ago because I wasn't aware of this research. But this is a gold standard research available to us. Okay. And this is a noise test. You make the patient do a single hop, the patient make a patient do a triple hop, and then patient do a crossover hop, and then do a six centimeter test timed hop. Okay. And you can find the normative data in this article. I'll share this article with you, where you have the normative data for each test. And the critical thing here is you should score greater than 80% on involved and uninvolved side. Okay. Dr. Ford, do you want to demonstrate noise test or we should just move forward and are you there, Dr. Ford? Yeah, let's go ahead and demonstrate it. So, Sophie, you got a sec? Okay, so I'm not going to actually like sit and measure and stuff like that, but at least let Sophia demonstrate this for us. So Soph, if you wanna just jump out your Crocs there. Okay. So what am I doing? So just pick off your Crocs, stand right here, and then I'll tell you what to do. Don't know if we wanna see this from the front or see it from the back, we'll watch it from the front. Okay. All right. So you're gonna stand on one leg, you're going to hop on one leg as far as you can. One hop on that leg. Go ahead. Good. And then we'll do the other leg. So start, sorry, start at the same place. And then hop as far as you can on the opposite leg. Great. Okay. The next one we're going to do is a triple hop. So starting in the same place on your left leg, you're going to go hop, 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 hop. Hop, good. And then we'll do the other leg. Hop, hop, hop. You can go back to the beginning. And of course you're gonna cue your patient to go for their max and you want them to be within 80%. The next one is the, is the hop over, is that right, TJ? Same leg? You can do both legs and compare. Yeah, so you're gonna start on your left leg on this side. And I've got a 15 centimeter wide line here. I'm gonna hop, hop, hop like that. Go ahead, let's do left leg and then right leg. Hop, hop, hop. Good. Go back and switch legs for me. So I'm going this way? Yep. What's the last one on the slide, Dr. Singh? Uh, timed hop test. So basically you can, they'll do like hops in like five seconds or the number of hops they can do in five seconds or, and compare. Okay. Side to side. okay. Okay. So I won't demonstrate that one, but you guys can refer to the slide. I don't know if we have enough of a runway for that. Yeah. So, okay. So over six meters. Work in, if you work in sports setting, I think this is a very, very relevant test. Because yep. when, you, when you work with the elite athletes, you know that whether this person needs a surgery now or not. This is a, that's why this is a very, very relevant 
screening guideline because the time is very important when you're working with them. So, yeah. Okay, let's talk about we're good for a minute. Some of the guidelines that came out recently and this is most mostly injury prevention what you should do for injury prevention, okay? So there we Okay. So the level A intervention for injury prevention is programs like 11, FIFA 11, Harmony, Nakantaro, Emory, Muvis. We're going to talk about one of the programs, which, yeah, that's a really good question. So this primarily is for sports population, but you can use for like recreational athletes. If you find young people who play sports recreationally, you can definitely use it on them. But this, this is primarily for athletes, screening guidelines. Yeah. We're going to talk, talk about FIFA 11. And this is a, these are, these are series of tests or series of exercises you do. I would not advise that for elderly patients now. Yeah. If you're, if you're seeing a 50 year old ACL deficient knee, your patient might fail the criteria right away. They may have some swelling. So the idea is that if your patient fails this criteria, criteria one, the screening guidelines, you're not moving on to this. Okay. So if your patient is not able to, patient has joint effusion and ACL deficient knee, the test is over. If patient is not able to hop, test is over. Patient does not have full knee range of motion, test is over. Okay. So you will only go to the second objective testing if your patient passes the subjective testing. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about FIFA 11, which is a, so you do various things with FIFA 11 and I'll share this with you. We'll probably share a video of how FIFA 11 should be instituted. Okay. So your patient or your athlete does running straight ahead, running hip out, running hip in, running in circling partner, running shoulder contacts. Okay. And this is basically an injury prevention program. This can also be used if your patient is a, if you're, if you're working with an athlete who's in later stages of rehab and they are trying to go back to sport or return to sport. Sure. You can do it on dancers as well. Okay. Then the second part of the test is, or second part of the treatment program is the bench. Bench is nothing but a plank. You can do a plank. You can do a, and you can do level one, level two, level three, and then you can do a side plank. Okay. And then you can do hamstrings. This is a, like specifically called Nordic hamstring. Uh, Dr. Kohl, do you mind demonstrating the plank and the side plank and the Nordic hamstring? So yeah. It's very, very. Yeah, yeah just, definitely. Just, Got it all set up. I'll share a video on the group so that you can, especially people who work with athletes, athletes, I think this is, and people who don't work with athletes, you can still get some ideas of advanced rehab ideas from this because this is primarily used for soccer players because you can see FIFA 11. So do you mind showing bench and sideways bench? Just show us a few ideas, show us a few blanks and side sure. blanks. Sure. So if you're ready. So just kick off your crocs. We're going to show off some planks. Guys, make sure you mute yourselves, please. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to share it on. Will you on show me just front plank? Facing that way. All right, so front plank, you guys know this one's pretty basic. Go ahead. Uh, look at this. Okay, that's a great front plank. Now level two, so if you're going you're gonna to alternate your legs, lifting them up one at a time, just a little bit, mm -hmm. and then switch. This is level two. Keep going, Soph, keep going, Soph. Okay, and then what was the level three on that slide? You, you, you lift it and you hold it. So lift and hold. Hold, 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 switch sides. Hold, hold. Hold, 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 relax. Okay, now face us. You, we're going to do a side plank. So shake it out for a sec, and then when you're ready, show us a side plank. Front bed. Facing this way, yeah, forearm bent. 
Um, let's face the camera though. Oh. Yeah. Perfect. So level one is static. Level two, we're going to raise and lower the hips. So drop your hips down, touch the floor, and then come back up. Down, up, down, up. Now lift your level three is lift the top leg into the air and hold it. You got it. You got it. Come on, track star. <laughs> there you go. Nice. All right. Thanks. So. And then the single leg standing stuff, right, Dr. Singh? Yes. All right. You know, so you're, you're gonna show the hamstring, like Nordic hamstring. Uh, you don't have to yeah, do we'll, it because it's a very hard activity to do, but we'll we'll show the Nordics over here. Yeah. So if you know Nordic ham curls. So. All right. So I'm gonna let my patient do modified version of these. We're gonna do Nordic ham curls. It's basically where I'm gonna hold your knees. You're gonna lower yourself down and pull yourself back up. But I'm gonna let you you can use a hand like lower yourself down, pull yourself back up using your hamstrings. Okay. All right. So we're gonna do a modified version. So we've got like a band or something to contact. Okay. So just pretend like she's not holding on to anything. You know, try without actually. Scooch back a little bit. Try without. Try not holding on. Let's test those hammies out. Okay, so I'm gonna hold your legs okay. and I want you to lower yourself. Keep your body straight, lower your chest down towards the ground. Just go as far as you can and then come back. Ah, no, 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 come what back you... up. <laughs> so you can't bend from the from the hips. Oh. You gotta keep your body straight. Yeah, arms across your chest. Lower yourself down just a little bit and then come back. Okay. Good, can you go further? Maybe. Maybe, let's see. Okay. Your hamstrings are like mine. And then come back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's scooch forward a little bit. I'm gonna let okay. you use the I'm gonna let you use the thing for your hand. Okay. All right. So just pretend like she's not holding on, and then I want you to go down as low as you can. Okay. Like everything straight. Yep. Uh huh. Low, 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 low. And then come back up. Yeah. So beginners should be able to get three to five. Intermediate seven to ten reps. Level three, 12 to fifteen reps. Um. I want to demonstrate another version of this in a little bit, but let's go and do the single leg standing. All right, so stand on one leg right here, facing the camera. All right, lift your other leg high up. So there's our single leg standing on a hard surface. Ken, go ahead and stand facing the trampoline. Single leg, one leg up. So that's level one. Here's level two. Toss the ball at the trampoline so, a couple times. Good. Now let me have the ball. Level three is she's going to stand like this, and I'm going to provide perturbations. I'm going to push her. She's got to try to keep her balance. Okay. <laughs> Additionally, you can also do those same things. Stand on one leg on the foam facing the cap. So. On a foam pad, you can do static standing, trampoline toss perturbations. We can do it on a BOSU ball. Okay, let's see. Static, you got it. Come on, Sophie. And then tramp toss and with perturbations as well. Okay. Nice. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks, so. So this is primarily for athletes. I mean, your normal patients might not be able to do this. So this is primarily for athletes and from from sport people who are trying to return to sport or you're trying to institute an in injury prevention program. Okay. You can also do squats with toe raises. You can do walking lunges, one leg squats. For plyometrics, you can do vertical jumps, lateral jumps, box jumps. Okay. And running across pitch, running bounding. Running bounding means you're running with exaggerated step length. Okay. Running plant and cut. Okay. Yeah. The research says that this is a level one evidence, level A evidence. It says that this, these programs should be instituted in athletes younger than 18 years. 
okay or in handball players says 15 to 17 which is very similar age group another component of research says that you should work on proximal control exercises and the bench or plank which dr ford was showing is also targeting your proximal control and combination of strength and plyometric exercises we, we spoke about vertical jumps lateral jumps box jumps they form the plyometric activity and then the research says that your training sessions should be if they are if they are doing once a week should be more than 20 minutes a session so you should definitely work on 20 minutes every time you see them on injury prevention okay and longer than 30 minutes per week okay compliance is very important that has a level a evidence and this should be done pre season and also during the season okay if you if you if you if you think your athletes especially pivoting athletes like at soccer players players who play like volleyball basketball tennis they should they should be they should be done during pre season and during the during the season as well okay and this was from sports section of APTA and I'll I'll share the details of this clinical prediction guidelines video. This came out very recently, so very it was very relevant to discuss this. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the the treatment part. Your stage one and two. So the stuff we discussed was stage three or four, and your injury prevention stuff. Now we're discussing stage one and two post injury. Okay. Anything you want to add, Dr. Ford? Yeah. So just before we move on, I wanted to set up a modification for the Nordic hamstring curls um, that you guys might be able to implement using some, some bands. So if, can you just come for a sec? Mm -hmm. I want to do that same Nordic ham curl. Took me a second to set it up. So on your knees, facing that way. I'm going to have you put this around your chest, maybe like just under your armpits, like above everything. Okay, and I'll hold your feet. You can do the go forward as far as you can. So this would be a modification that you guys could do for Nordic ham curls. Okay, see so you've got the band here. Go ahead, go again. Go as far as you can. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I got your legs. Come on up. Nice. That's better. Okay, cool. Nope, that's all I wanted to add. Good demonstration. Yeah. Okay, let's let's talk about evidence-based guideline. I think this came out in 2016. So this is a little older clinical prediction guideline. They update every 10 years. So I think this will come out again in 2026. And this is from orthopedic section. And what do they say? The, the question is whether you should use open kinematic chain or closed kinematic chain quadriceps exercise. And this is, these findings are very, very specific. So all of us treat ACL repairs, but I think some of the some of the clinical criteria is very straightforward and very specific. So I think I, that's why I really like this. So, so they say that CKC or closed kinematic chain exercises have found to reduce pain, less risk of increased laxity, and better outcomes. Okay. OKC should not be used within first to six eights. Complete range OKC. So this is a critical thing. So if you're treating a patient with with ACL repair, regardless of the graph, make sure that you're not using any OKC complete range exercises within first six to eight weeks. Okay. As far as OKC compared at four weeks and eight weeks, they found more laxity when it was used at four weeks. So make sure that you're not instituting or not using OKC exercises within first eight weeks of rehab. Okay. Conclusion is CKC and OKC both can be used for gaining quadricep strength. OKC can be performed at four weeks of post-operative, but should only be used in 90 to 45 degrees of range. And Dr. Ford, do you mind showing what we talk about 90 to 45 degree range here? So people understand this. So this is a very, very... So... All right, so we're coming for a sec. Um, come sit at the edge of this table, facing that way. Sweet. Mm -hmm. So 90 to 45, 
facing this way, sorry. You're good. No, 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 this way. <laughs> and then scooch back a little bit. Okay. Okay. This one's pretty self-explanatory, guys. But if we're talking about 90 to 45, we're talking about from flexion, 90 degrees of flexion, to only 45 degrees there. You could do it in a long arc quad, like this one, 90 to 45, or you could do it in a short arc quad, lay on your back, and scooch up towards the pillow, and scooch up. He's bent. Okay. That's about 90. And then I would give her a target to about 45. Short arc quad. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the criteria, the, the clinical criteria is very, very straightforward. Enough evidence out there that if you prematurely use OKC, okay. It causes increased laxity. And this was a long-term study where they studied laxity using a knee arthrometer one or two years down the line, one or two years down the line. And they found that increased laxity if OKC exercises are used prematurely at four weeks. And this is complete range. So make sure that you're using We will talk about isometrics also. What first four weeks? Okay. Eccentric exercises should be used in first three weeks. So three weeks after the after the ACL repair, regardless of the graft you should institute or advise eccentric exercises. And the recommendations are, eccentric exercises should be closed kinematic chain. Okay. Okay, maybe like a mini squat is fine if you're, if you're trying to, trying to, and this should come after three weeks of ACL repair. Okay. Neuromuscular training or balance training can, can be started within first four weeks. Isometric exercises are safe from week one as long as they don't cause any pain. If they cause any pain, then you're not doing it. Also the, also the recommendation is that immediate weight bearing does not affect knee laxity and decrease the incidence of anterior knee pain. So there are certain surgeons or some surgeons, I don't know, want to name anybody, but who wait like four weeks before they start weight bearing patients. But the research and evidence says that the weight bearing should happen right away. Okay. And there's enough evidence out there which says that immediate weight bearing decreases incidence of anterior knee pain. Yeah. Straightforward guidelines. Question coming. Hamstring strengthening can happen, also happen right away, but it has to be close kinematic chain. Yeah. Hamstring strengthening can happen right away, but it has to be isometric and close kinematic chain. In this specific situation, it says complete weight bearing, immediate weight bearing. Okay. Okay. Surprisingly, this was a surprise to me, and this is this comes from a lot of European literature, European research. They say that electrical stimulation, when combined with rehabilitation, is effective in improving strength up to two months. After that, no long. So there was a systemic review. Last went out. So of I think this comes from like British Medical Journal, and I'll share the CPG with you. You can definitely look at that specific article as well. So electrical stimulation, when you combine it with rehabilitation, it has shown to improve muscle strength. So electrical stimulation, we discourage the use of electrical stimulation in a program, but with post ACL repair or post ACL reconstruction, you you tend to see improvement in muscle strength with electrical stimulation with rehab.
that's a good question if we if if it is along with meniscal repair then we can start weight bearing immediately no that's a different thing we're just talking about acl repair if it's a if meniscus gets involved other structures get involved things things are different we're just talking about acl repair here yeah these guidelines are these are guidelines are for pure acl acl reconstruction and acl injuries yep electromyographic feedback have shown to improve post surgical pain and we have level 2 evidence for that Let's talk about cryotherapy and cryotherapy is used a lot. The research says that cryotherapy is only beneficial for decreasing pain. It has absolutely no effect on swelling or post-operative drainage. So if you're using cryotherapy for pain relief, it's fine. But if you're using for swelling, it has an absolute, absolute no, no. Okay. But that's, that's level one evidence as well. Okay. Yeah. Talking about return to sports, ideally you should use extensive battery of tests, limb symmetry index. One more question coming. Hamstring hang is advisable. I think it's a passive exercise, so I, I guess it is. When can we start ham skulls? Ham skull is a open kinematic chain exercise, right? It's OKC. So we'll talk about specifically about OKC criteria in little more detail. You can use some active exercises to reduce swelling. Cryo does not have any, any evidence supporting it. Okay. Let's talk about re-injury. Re so this is a very interesting slide and I, I need your feedback on how you should approach this. So the they have found that there is more, more and more evidence coming out which says that if you have an ACL injury, you have a higher chance of having another ACL injury on the opposite side. Okay, so there is a higher risk of contralateral ACL injury than the injury on the than injury on the same side. It's greater than ten percent. Okay, and uh, altered neuromuscular control biomechanics, increase in hip internal rotation. Dynamic knee valgus. Dr. Fort spoke about dynamic knee valgus in like greater detail. He spent like almost 30 minutes talking about affected altered knee biomechanics last time in our first cohort course. And that has seen that has seems it has a level two evidence for contralateral knee injury and re-injury both. Okay. I think there's a slide for it. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Not in detail that detail, but because this, I think you're. Yeah, actually, I do. And perhaps before the end of the lecture today, uh, Dr. Singh, from your screen share, if you'll Google um, RG3, the famous football player, RG3, RG3 combine jump pictures. And this guy, so one of the world's premier athletes, one of the most famous football players in the USA during his time, and was not that long ago, but he is basically doing a maximal jump. So, so the NFL combine is where they get these guys that are NFL potentials, uh, National Football League potentials, hopefuls, and they make them do short sprints. They make them do maximum vertical jumps, and they make them do a variety of different athletic things um and score them and stuff like that and it helps with their eligibility it helps them get picked up by teams and stuff like that and there are still shots of this player rg3 robert griffin the third and when he's doing his max jump he falls into the most nightmarish dynamic valgus you've ever seen and guess what injury ended this player's career not one, but two ACL injuries. So he had he, he started playing for a pro team, uh, the Redskins, I think. And he had an ACL injury, which he rehabbed for about a year. And then he came back. And after playing again for some time, um, he re-injured the same knee. And each time he injured it, it's because he himself fell into this dynamic valgus position. Dr. Singh, I don't know if you can jump onto like a Google picture of it real quick. Were you able to find the one that I was talking about? Yeah, I, let me, the end? yeah I can actually find it so that I can show them. I think this is it. So, 
I can share. And once screen. we pull up the picture, I just I'll I know we talked about it in our first class, and we'll talk about it in our on our hip, knee, ankle course as well. But I'll say a few things about it if you can pull up that pick that picture real quick. RG three combine jump and then just search images. One second, and my computer is just working so slowly. No worries. It's worth the wait, guys, I promise. Because I think the next time you'll see that in the clinic, I think you'll never forget it. So that's, that's a point. Yeah. While Dr. Singh is looking for it, if you guys want to just check out my screen real quick, I can go ahead and demonstrate for you. So when he's going for his maximum jump, we should see person comes down, right? Knees are separated. And then you throw your arms, come up and land also with the knees separated. But this particular football player, when he went for his maximum jump, what happened? That, literally that, but so bad. And this was his jump. And then we landed, same thing, dynamic valgus. And so, you know, no doubt. So number one, this is his chosen movement pattern. This is how his body patterns movement. And that's a problem. So that's a habit that we would need to break. The other thing is he may have muscle imbalance. He may be weak in the hip abductors and external rotators, right? Gluteus maximus, gluteus medius. And then on the inside of the hip, there are six different external rotators that are smaller. We call them the intrinsic hip external rotators. And they are obturator internus and externus, superior and inferior gemellus, and quadratus femoris. Can you guys, do you guys mind just uh, muting yourself real quick? I'm going to repeat those muscle groups. If you have overpronation, dynamic knee valgus, a femur that's internally rotating, okay? Gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, piriformis, quadra uh, quadratus femoris, obturator internus and externus, and superior and inferior gemellus. And while we're waiting on Dr. Singh, I'll demonstrate one more thing. So. When we strengthen our gluteus maximus, right, we can do obviously like bridges, squats, and stuff like that. Um, clamshells, right? You guys know clamshells, sidesteps, monster walks. If we want to strengthen the deep hip external rotators, which is a muscle group that's often missed, we do an exercise called pretzel, and this is it right here hip at 90 degrees, and we are internally. Sorry, we're externally rotating the leg. When we do external rotation activities with the hip in neutral, it works on glute max, glute medius. When the hip is in neutral, in other words, when your hip is close to zero degrees or perhaps below 30 degrees of hip flexion. But when we do external rotation activities with the hip at 90 degrees, now we've turned, we've put glute max, glute medius at a mechanical disadvantage and we're able to engage the other hip external rotators. So when we're trying to fix dynamic valgus at the knees, we really need to, um, we really need to do strengthening at 90 degrees and also below 90 degrees. So we can tackle all the different hip external rotator muscle groups. Dr. Singh, are you there? Okay. So I think Dr. Singh is having some technical difficulties. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate a few things real quick. So, right, so for gluteus maximus, we talked about bridges, single leg bridges. And then we can get into other things like squats, right? Squats single leg squats, okay? 
If we want to hit gluteus medius, which is one of the hip external rotators and abductors, we can do clams. We could do clams with the band around the knees, right? Banded clams, that's harder. If you've got an athletic population, you might want to try out some side plank clams. See that side plank clam with or without a band? That's gluteus medius. That's working that gluteus medius muscle pretty hard. So if you bring me a loop, like a band for around the knees. Any color is fine. We want to work gluteus medius and hip external rotators in closed chain, standing, weight bearing. Thanks. We can do band around the knees. We can do squats. We can do monster walks. These are monster walks, forwards and backwards, keeping the knees apart. I tell my patients, because this will be the problem on one leg, this will be the problem on one leg. And I tell my patients, if there's a line that connects your hip and your foot, I want the knees to be outside that line. Just a sec, Dr. Singh, I'll give it back to you, okay? So that's band around the knees. That's hard on gluteus medius and glute max. Band around the ankles is harder. And then band around the front of the toes is the hardest based on, based on uh, EMG band around the toes. And we can do those different exercises in a frontal plane. We can also do the same exercises, call this one side steps with the band around the feet, with the band around the ankles is a little bit easier. Band around the knees is a little bit easier. But the whole time as the PT, gotta make sure the knees are not like this, not one knee, not both knees. If there's a line from the hips to the ankles, the knees need to be outside of that line. Okay, the only exception, and this might go over some of your heads, it's okay, but the only exception is what happens if you get a male or female patient, more likely female, that has a degree of antiversion in the hip, right? So structurally, the hip is antiverted, which means that they're going to naturally have a little bit more internal rotation of the lower extremity. So we don't take every single patient and tell them that their feet have to point out 8 to 15 degrees, which is the norm. Okay, If I have a patient with a lot of antiversion, and let's say they're pigeon-toed, I will not force their hip to come out way past its kind of neutral zone or its comfort zone. So that's why we do Craig's test. That's why we look at femoral version, antiversion, retroversion. So we can make modifications on our squatting form, walking form, golfing form, cricket form, whatever. Okay, so that might have gone over a few people's heads. That's okay. Um, feel free to shoot in the message box and we can talk more about it later. But I'm going to go ahead and give it back to Dr. Singh since he's back now. Oh, Dr. Singh, sorry, one more thing. There was because there was a question about this, and it's it's where I was going with all of this. We talked about the big hip external rotators, and then I I demonstrated pretzel. So let me just review the pretzel for you guys. This is the deep hip external rotators, or the um, the hip intrinsic external rotators. Okay, so we've talked about gluteus maximus, gluteus medius. Now, if you guys want to go after the six hip external rotators that are deep inside the hip. Bring your hip up to 90 degrees. The knee is also at 90 degrees and the hip stays down on the mat and you're externally rotating the leg up and down. We call this the pretzel exercise, pretzel, P-R-E-T-Z-E-L. Of course, you guys can name it something else if you want to, the name doesn't matter, but this is how we go after some of the deep hip external rotator muscles, right? All right, TJ, back to you. So, <laughs> Let's talk about pre-operative guidelines. I, uh, let me just share this again. I think my laptop is working funky. Okay, so 
talking about pre-operative rehabilitation guidelines. So the evidence says that if your patient who's planning to undergo knee repair or ACL repair does not has extension deficits and side to side difference in quadricep strength before the surgery is greater than 20% from side to side, then this person will have extension deficits after the surgery. So I think this is for people who work closely with surgeons. It's a good educational thing for, for surgeons. Again, there's research out there that this person should undergo prehab and make sure that they don't have extension deficits before the surgery. There's level two evidence that says that if you have extension lag before the surgery, you're going to potentially have extension lag after the surgery, regardless of the quality of rehab you're going to do. Okay. So it's, I think it's a good educational thing for surgeons and doctors if they should aware about this evidence. Okay. Talking about post-operative rehabilitation, research says that a person should undergo nine to 12 months of rehab. Um, that includes inpatient rehab, outpatient rehab, rehab in the, in, the, in the field, rehab with the trainer, rehab with the personal trainer. Combining everything, there should be at least nine to 12 months. And that's a recommendation. Yeah. They compared 19 week and 32 week rehabilitation program and they found no difference. Yeah. In laxity, range of motion, self-reported measure, single leg to half distance and isokinetic strength. Yeah. Going back to cryotherapy, I think we spoke about how cryotherapy only has evidence in first, first week. It's a level one evidence in reducing pain. That's about it. Okay. Isometric exercises, level two evidence should only be done in the first post operative week. Okay. No pain with activation. If they have difficulty activating and they have pain with it, don't do it. Yeah. And I think this is probably the most important slide because the, there are like very, very clear guidelines here. And a lot of us can, can go wrong here. So closed kinematic chain exercises at two weeks and open kinematic chain at four weeks from 90 to 45 degrees of knee flexion at five weeks, 90 to 30 degrees of knee flexion at six weeks, 90 to 20 degrees of knee flexion at seven weeks, 90 to 10. And you should only do full knee extension at eight weeks. And this is open kinematic chain. So just a basic long arc quads in complete range of motion should only be done at eight weeks. Surprisingly, CKC is not that painful because it causes co-activation of various muscle groups. Okay. Yeah. Another important thing is no weight should be added up to 12 weeks with OKC. So if you, even if you want to do one pound, you should only add additional weight at 12 weeks with open kinematic chain. And these are very, very specific guidelines because they have seen that if you, if you, if you do open kinematic chain exercises too early in the rehab, in a long-term, a one-year long-term study and a two-year long-term study, they have seen more joint laxity on a knee arthrometer. So regardless of how good the rehab is, OKC full range of motion should be achieved at eight weeks. Yeah, you can start at eight weeks and then go up till 12 weeks. And then at, after 12 weeks, you can add some weight to that OKC. And that's level two evidence. You have a randomized control trial and there are multiple randomized control trials talking about this stuff. Yeah. And these are very, very specific recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about neuromuscular control and biomechanics, which Dr. Ford was showing us, it's also about the quality of movement that prevent re-injuries. And I'm going to try to share the, I'm going to try to share the RG3 picture again with you, but it's all, it's all about biomechanics. I'm going to show you this picture. I think this picture comes from the first cohort class, the first module we discussed. So this is dynamic valgus C. The valgus angle here, knees are falling in, poor glute meat control, poor core control can do that. Isometrics could be done at different angles as long as they don't produce pain. That's a recommendation. 
Yeah. Okay, so return to play, I think there is no common consensus on what should be the criteria, but this is a recommendation. So you can do a limb symmetric index test, which is which combines of strength testing and series of hops. Side-by-side -side difference should not be greater than 10%. So you should, if you're instituting or conducting a limb symmetric index on the right side, it should be greater than 90%. I think there are no recommendations, specific recommendations for hamstring over quadriceps. The idea here is that for OKC, you should follow this. For CKC, you can start at two weeks, regardless whether you're working on quadriceps or hamstring. Yeah. So, I mean, there is there's stuff we read in the books, but, they, but then we also have to follow the literature, right? What research says. Okay, and these are the two reference guidelines. I'm going to quickly share the picture of RG3. If my laptop doesn't act funky, I'll sh stop share here. I can find that because I definitely want to share that with you. And because you'll see that in the clinic all the time. Yeah. Let me share the screen with you. Yeah, it, guys, look at that. Look at that. This I mean, is this, this is a premier world class athlete and his coach and his trainers and his whatever is allowing him to do this. Are you joking me? So my guess is, you know, when he's doing weights and exercises, my guess is they're obviously having him do correct form in the weight room. But what this goes to show is that when he's not being told what to do, when he's not being followed what to do, or when he's giving maximal effort, right? So that's something else that happens. The more effort you give, sometimes the more our, our faults can show, right? The form is perfect when he sits down and stands up, but when he's giving his maximum effort, this is his default movement pattern, and that's a problem. And he should have had a PT somewhere come alongside and said, you can't do this like ever, 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 ever. Why is he choosing? Why? What's happening here? My guess is he's just so quadricep dominant, TFL dominant, and weak in the glute, in the glute max, glute medius, and hip external rotators. So anyways, I mean, this this picture is crazy to me because he's an elite athlete and this is what we see. And anyways, yeah, this guy, you know, he injured the same ACL twice and uh, ended his career as a football player. And it's no it's no surprise why. So yeah, he's, no he's no longer no, 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 no longer playing. Right. No, he's done. Right? Nope. He's done. So, so. OK, so well, let's go back to that. We'll share both the clinical pr uh, practice guidelines with you and a video about FIFA, how to institute FIFA 11. I think that is it from our side. Anything yep. you want to ask Dr. Ford about the- No, program? listen, listen, you guys. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we offer at GEM. Can't say that we're going to offer free courses for you know these short updates for free for forever. Um, we'd love for you guys to join us in the cohort. The cohort is mostly online, but we will come and be doing in-person hands-on trainings that complement the training that we've done online. So you can do the online stuff only. That's fine. You can do the in-person stuff only in India. We'll be doing probably uh, new Delhi and, and, and Mumbai or something like that. 
but that's also, it's just, it's way better when you get everything. The hands-on stuff will be much easier because we'll have reviewed it. We'll have discussed the theory. We'll have demonstrated it a couple of times before the, the in-person um, hands-on training. And so we recommend that you guys join us, come on board if you like what you guys saw. Um, we love teaching, we love doing it. And definitely our goal is to have better physiotherapists all over the world. So um, we have rolling admissions for a little bit longer. Feel free to jump on. I think we may also have a discount running for a little bit longer. And then after that, once we take off, it's it's not gonna be as, this year will be the least expensive it's gonna be ever because it's our starting year. So now's a really good time to jump in and become part of our core group maybe become a mentor, maybe teach with us, maybe house some of our students that will come and work with you and they'll be paying to work with you as you impart your you know, newfound knowledge and skill set onto new PTs. And that's what it's all about. You know, it's all about having you know, better care for our patients, better outcomes for our patients. For me personally, I enjoy my job way more because I've attained a level at which I treat my patients very effectively. Nothing comes into my clinic that I don't know what's going on, that I'm confused, that I'm unsure about. And so there's so many, so many reasons that we have this ongoing pursuit of knowledge and education. And if you're a PT, that comes with hands-on skills as well. Dry needling, manipulation, muscle energy technique, mobilization, and GEM, we pride ourselves on being the one-stop shop for all of it. You're gonna learn a little bit of everything, all the approaches that are out there, we're going to talk about them and put them in their place according to uh, the, the latest evidence and stuff like that. So in other words, we'll show some McKenzie stuff. Where does that fit into our treatment for low back pain and neck pain patients? We'll show some mobilization for movement. Where's that effective? Where's that not effective? And so instead of ascribing to one single philosophy, you get everything. It's an eclectic approach. That's our training for OCS, orthopedic specialists, and fellowship trained PTs in the USA. It's an eclectic approach. So you learn everything, which I think is better because then instead of trying to box a patient into one single approach, which the evidence doesn't always support for every single thing that we treat, you'll have a, a massive toolbox. So thank you guys so much for joining in. It was really a great pleasure. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys at the next lecture that we do whenever that may be. Dr. Singh, thank you. Thank you. We'll stick around for five, 10 minutes to take your questions and then we'll definitely yep. share this lecture on YouTube for now. And uh, this could be a three hour class if you want, but That's I mean, okay. I think- Thank you so much. You're welcome to, well, I guess I'm moving pretty quick, so let's bust out of here. Dr. Singh, if it's all right with you, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. I've got a meeting coming up. No problem. Thanks for throwing that all together. That was really a fantastic, dense, and really useful uh, update. I'm not saying you're dense. I'm saying the content was dense. I'm getting dense, too. <laughs> 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 we'll stick around for five more minutes if you have any questions yes you can if you didn't already punch in for those hours you can punch in for those hours. yeah you can just send me a uh so i will share some exercises with you where I think they say gluteus medius and TFL activation is higher. Gluteus medius versus TFL activation is higher. They're more, both are AB ductors of the hip. So with every activity, both of them activate together, but with there are certain exercises where they have found that gluteus medius activation and TFL activation ratio is higher. So I will share some ideas on the group. Yes, I share some pictures on the group. And most of these, most of these exercises come from like electromyographic studies where they put electrodes on gluteus medius and then they put electrodes on, on TFL and then they do the activity and then they share, they, they, they compare the MVCs, maximum voluntary contraction of both muscles and they see what, what, what the amount of activation is with certain activity. I think the, the, the funny thing is that there was nothing nothing in the CPGs about splints. 
I know a lot of physicians recommend splints. There was, there was nothing about splints and clinical practice guidelines. And I'll share the guidelines on the group with you guys. But there is absolutely nothing about the splints. And research and evidence on splints is not almost, almost non-existent. Activity modification is where the focus is, where you have to avoid certain activities rather than putting you in the splint. Post-op complications could be extension lag, but CPG says that if you manage the extension lag before the surgery, you're going to prevent it. But if splints know the how to prevent OKC, you just have to prevent OKC exercises. Patient will do some OKC stuff, but doesn't mean that you're going to do OKC exercise. Right? So I think that uh, I'm not a fan of Lily's test. What happens is when somebody discovers a test of makes a test, the research is very biased. The research is very, very biased. So, I mean, we can talk about Lily's test, but most of the, most of, most of the clinical practice guidelines, the guidelines don't even mention Lily's test. So I would just, I would just consider Lachman as the gold standard test. Yeah. Maybe like five years, 10 years down the line when the Lily's test is more researched and more money being spent on it, there is more evidence on it. Structurally pronated feet predispose in ACL tear. There is no, there is no research supporting that. And then pronation and yes, it will predispose you to, to junior valgum or dynamic knee valgus, but there's no, there is no research supporting that, that if you have pronation, you're going to have more ACL tears. So there, I think we discussed the clinical criteria, whether the person should undergo ACL reconstruction or not. I have not found any other research. If patient is not willing, then of course the patient will not go undergo. But as far as research is concerned, we have a very cl clear criteria when or when not to do do ACL repair. Yeah. We'll be sharing this lecture on, on, on social on, on YouTube so that you guys can go and look look at the slides again. Why more chances of contralateral knee injury? Oh, that's a very, very interesting. I, I, I tried researching it. And my answer to that question is that when you have deficits on one side, you probably tend to favor the other side. Another, another thing is that there are certain biomechanical factors, especially in young females, that has shown to have a strong correlation with ACL injuries. But that strong factor is very narrow intracondylar notch. Okay? So if you have a narrow intracondylar notch, you tend to have bilateral, bilateral ACL injury. Okay? So those two factors, lack of control on one side and narrow intracondylar notch. Those are the two common factors that can cause ACL injury on the opposite side, contralateral ACL injury. But I think that that's an important point to worry about if you're training patients with ACL, you have to work on both sides. Yeah. If your patient does not have complete ROM range of motion, then the patient is not a candidate for rehabilitation, considering patient had like a complete ACL tear. Yeah. 
I think the, the, the com most common factor of extension lag is not a tight graph. The common factor is this, this patient had ACL, ACL extension lag before the surgery. If you have extension lag before the surgery, you're going to have extension lag after the surgery. And that's why patient and caregiver education is important. Physician education is important. Uh, does training both sides of quadriceps reduces the chances of injury to the contralateral side? I don't know the evidence to that. I, don't, I haven't seen any article talking about. It. It's hard to research re-injury, right? How would you how would you research re-injury? It's almost impossible to research re-injury. When can we start stimulation? Within first two months, you can do stimulation. That's what the research says. Yeah. You said simulation. You said simulation training. There is no clear guideline given to simulation, but I think I would I would consider three three months or twelve weeks. What exercise work to well manage extension extension lag? We basically work in. I I think this is just from like pref, like personal preference. I if if my patient is not able to do extension against gravity because of because of inhibition of quadriceps, I would like to do like sideline extensions. I've tried like sideline extensions to work like probably like grade two, less than grade three. Ask the patient to extend against, against basically in a gravity eliminated plane. Okay, so you're basically doing sideline knee extensions. So that the gravity you're not working against gravity. Any more questions, guys? The simulation can come at, at like 12, 12, 12 weeks. How to go about the course? Please contact Dr. Dhumi. You'll find our, our, you can find us on, you can send a message on, on Instagram or on WhatsApp. And Dr. Dhrumi can share details with you. Grade two osteoarthritic changes in knee post ACL. How do we deal in such scenarios? I think I think you can work on certain things with osteoarthritis. I think we're going to talk about osteo osteoarthritis in a greater detail in our future course and what evidence says about that. Can patellofemoral improve mobility? Yes, patellofemoral mobility can improve knee range of motion, but the problem in ACL reconstruction or ACL repair is, or pre-ACL pre is not patellofemoral mobility. The problem is inhibition of quadriceps in the end range. And there is a controversy whether VMO does it or the whole quadricep does it, but we for sure know that whenever you have an ACL repair or any intra-articular pathology in the knee, you tend to have some inhibition in the end range. Yeah. Patellar femoral mobility can be used, but it's usually not the factor that is restricting knee range of motion. Especially, I'm talking about ACL, ACL reconstruction, or ACL injury. I will definitely share a lot of stuff on the group so that you can, you guys can. Sort of diet and prevention of injuries. That's a totally different topic. I mean, I don't know the research on it, but definitely. Just from just just telling you, yeah, there is definitely a role in injury healing and stuff like that. But nutrition can be a different science. I mean, can, we can talk about it, but I mean, I I don't think I can I can quote any research articles or evidence here. Can kinesophobia, that's actually a very, very interesting question. So kinesophobia means that you, you're scared to move. And you're, when you're scared to move, I mean, 
can it cause re-injury? That's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to it, but that's an interesting, interesting question. I think definitely worth discussing about researching among athletes. I mean, it's a very, very interesting question. I mean, well, I'll have an answer to this. I'll probably research and I'll get back to you on this. It's a very interesting question. This is this is very very dense for like a one hour lecture, but I mean we want to we want to discuss this stuff again and again so that you guys know what's out there. I mean this is important information. Yeah. 